Hey there, thanks for tuning in. You ready for another episode of my Bigfoot sighting? All right then, let's do this. Seen a bunch of rundown new horse towns where the church is the backbone, loves in the plow, and the five string melodies grooving. With the farmland rows where the roots run deep, beyond the noise of the busy streets. Where the songs of the South are soothing When I hear the front porch picking down Home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah If you'd like to be able to listen to the show without ads and have full access to bonus content, that's an option. To find out how, Please go to MyBigfootSighting.com. My Bigfoot sightings have happened in two different states, so I'll start with Pennsylvania first. The first time I ever thought I saw a Bigfoot or did see a Bigfoot would have been when I was about seven and a half or eight years old. I lived in a town called Derry, Pennsylvania, and during the 70s, there were quite a few sightings around that area to the point where it was even on the radio a few times when I was a kid. I remember they would tell you not to be out after dark in certain areas and to bring your pets in because they were having issues with, and they came right out and said that they were having issues with a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch. So we lived in this town called Derry, Pennsylvania. I lived on a lot that had a lot of woods and they were connected to other towns almost. There, there was just a massive amounts of woods. Now it's all trailer park and other houses, unfortunately. So our parents would put us to bed even in the summertime around seven o'clock, seven thirty. We had to be in bed. Uh, that's just the way things were done back then, I guess, in the seventies. I'm fifty now, so this is when I was seven or seven and a half. And so we would go up to bed, and we would all go up to my mother's bedroom at first because her bedroom was connected to all the other bedrooms. It was like a a great room, like a big room. And we would sit in her bed and we had a portable radio. And back in the 70s and 80s, if you would turn the radio dial to find the stations the whole ways down to the left, you could actually pick up channel 11 off of the TV, but you could just pick up the audio. So we would go sit in this bed, me and my three siblings, and we would turn the dial the whole ways down and we would listen to Little House on the Prairie. So while we were doing this, we would play and talk, and but we would be looking out a window, out the bedroom window above the bed. And as I said, we lived on a fairly large lot that was surrounded by woods on three sides. And we had various different trees out there. We had some apple trees. We had some plum trees or apricot trees. I believe it was our plum. I can't quite remember. I think it was plum trees. And uh, we also had cages outside with rabbits that my parents raised for show so we would sit up there and it was still very light out because we were in bed so early and we would listen to the radio and we'd, i'd be looking out the window and my sister and i might be looking out the window and as it got darker as it started getting towards dusk if you would watch the tree line off to the left of the house you'd see a little bit of movement and we all I mean, I wouldn't say we all knew there were Bigfoots around there, but we were always told there were Bigfoots around there. You could hear things at night that didn't sound quite right. Uh, it would sound like almost a woman screaming at night sometimes, but a little weirder. Almost, I would say you would mix it with a bobcat and a woman. It was just very off pitch. So we were looking out the window. And we were, you would look towards the left, up towards the wood line, and you'd see a little bit of movement as it got a little darker and a little darker. Finally, when it was fairly dark, but you could still see, it was just at the very end of day, they would come to the edge of the wood line. And I believe it was a family because there was sometimes three, sometimes four. And what you would see is you would look like, say, if you got distracted, you'd be playing around on the bed and you'd look up, you'd notice there's four stumps from like trees at the edge of the wood line that weren't there before. Then if you really looked, they weren't stumps. What they were doing is they would sit down on their haunches and wrap their legs around their or arms around their legs and not move. And they would just sit there 
very still. And I guess they were surveying to see if anybody was around or whatever. But if you would just quickly look at them, they just look like tree stumps. So that would catch your attention because you know, hey, there's no tree stumps there. And then would keep watching and keep watching. And eventually, and it would take quite a long time, they would stretch out onto their stomachs and begin to crawl across the yard towards the trees, towards the apple trees or towards the uh, other fruit trees. And they would crawl really slow. I, I, w- I would say it would take to cross maybe 20 feet of land. It would probably take them almost 20 minutes or more. They would just crawl ultra slow. And I think they were doing this to avoid detection. So you'd see first one of the bigger ones go first. And then if they had the little ones with them, and when I say little, I'm not saying little like a kid. I would say they were probably it was hard to tell from the distance and I was young, but now that I think back on it, little would be like six foot tall, maybe six and a half feet tall. So the little ones would go in between the big ones if they were with them. And then there would be a big one on the end or one would stay back and just stay there. And I guess maybe he'd be watching. So they would crawl this long distance and take forever to do it. And then when they would get up to the trees, then they would finally stand up But when they would stand up, they would stay really close to the trees and only one at a time would do it. And they would reach up and take whatever they wanted. And then they would start their journey back to the wood line. And that's how it would go for nights and nights. We'd see it every other night. That was the first time I'd ever seen one. Then you would have to flash forward a little bit, maybe a month or two or three. And we would start to hear people running through the yard but it sounded like really big people it just didn't sound right and then you would hear we were building a extra room onto our house every now and then you would hear something just smack up against the side of the house so hard everything inside would shake and then if you'd go out the next morning there'd be huge dents in the aluminum siding but the dents would be like seven foot off the ground which was kind of strange and this would go on for nights at a time maybe a week at a time then you wouldn't hear anything and then we had an issue where our rabbits we went out one day and the cage was ripped open and all the rabbits were turned inside out and it just seemed really weird i mean they weren't eaten just the chicken wire was ripped open and the rabbits were literally turned inside out so that's when we figured out there was just something definitely going on And then shortly after that, and I know I remember reading about it somewhere as an adult, but I also remember being told about it when I was younger. There was an incident where a couple police officers and a farmer supposedly had chased one down into a coal mine. It was killing cattle or terrorizing pets or something of the sort. And my uncle was supposedly one of the people that were with them. They chased it to the, uh, coal mine but they wouldn't go in after it and that's when we started talking about we were relatively sure there were a lot of coal mines and old caverns around this area and we believe they most likely lived in those or used them somehow to stay undetected so that's what happened most of the time in pennsylvania when i was younger then i you know we moved after a divorce and i really hadn't seen anything or heard anything because we moved into the city a little bit, not a huge city, a small city. But, you know, you always think about these things because you know you weren't daydreaming. There were people there when you saw it. You know, the ones that would come out of the woods, the best way to describe them, they were black. And they didn't have, you'll hear stories how they have long flowing hair. And not to jump too far in my, ahead of my story, but I have seen different types and there has to be different types or just like there's different types of people and some did have hair like that but these ones were black mostly black with a, a shorter closer hair i would almost want to say like a gorilla and that's what they look like they just like heavily muscled very tall short with black hair i want to go back i i actually forgot to tell you one thing the last thing we ever did see of them when we were still living in that house is we used to 
I told you we'd be sent to bed early every night. And, you know, to put it mildly, my dad wasn't the nicest guy and he didn't always want to let us have dinner and that'd always be a lot of a punishment or just something he did, you know, go to bed hungry. So my mom always said, oh, if you're hungry, tell us you have a hair in your throat when you're sleeping and I'll be able to get you some bread. That sounds funny, but that's what she did. So the stairs to go upstairs were across the floor from our laundry room. And our laundry room had about a seven and a half or eight foot tall window. And so one night I was coming down the steps and I sat on the steps I told my mom I had a hair in my throat and she was going to go get me some bread and she got me some bread and she said, sit here and eat it. And she went off and did her thing. And I was sitting there eating bread and I looked up out of the laundry room and it was dusk and there was a Bigfoot looking in the window, but this was a totally different Bigfoot than I'd ever seen. He was gray. He wasn't white. He wasn't black. He had gray, a lot of gray and he had longer hair. And the creepiest thing was he was smiling. He was smiling and he tapped on the window. And when he did that, I just froze. I mean, I was like eight years old. I was terrified. So he smiled even bigger and he'd gesture for me to come towards the window. And then he'd tap on the window again and gesture for me to come over. And there's no way I was going over there what he looked like his face he had very large eyes but all you could see was black just very little white around the edge you could hardly see any it was a lot of black he had uh big teeth but they weren't fangs and they weren't all dull either i mean i can remember this like a picture they were blocked off in the front like you know, flat teeth. And then he had some type of canines on the sides, but not huge. Sort of like, basically like ours, maybe a little bit elongated. But his mouth basically looked like ours, like his teeth, but everything was just bigger. And his smile was not, he looked crazy. I mean, that's the only way to explain it. He's trying to be friendly looking, I guess, or whatever, motion me over. But I was not going over there. I did not feel like it was a good thing. I didn't feel like he was being inviting. In my heart, I felt like if I walked over to the window, he was going to smash it and grab me. And thats I just had the worst feeling. The hair was standing up on the back of my neck. It is right now while I talk about it. And that's the closest I ever came one in Derry, Pennsylvania, was that window. And I would n- never want to be that close again. It was just absolutely terrifying. Like I said, the more he would tap on the window and wave you over. So then I finally just screamed for my mom and ran upstairs. And I don't know what became of him if he ran off or whatever. So, like I said, fast forward, we moved to a bigger city, a bigger town. And then we moved again to yet a bigger town. So we are probably, I don't know, 18, 16 miles away from where I grew up and it's been years. So I started dating a girl. I was like 16 at the time, maybe 15. And I had this girl I liked, but she lived in a town close to the town where I used to live. And I didn't have a car or anything because I was too young. So I used to walk from this bigger town from Greensburg to another town called New Alex, New Alexandria. And, um, I would walk down the main route 30 for most of it, but then she lived back on farmland. So I had to go out into the country and go back on farm roads and I'd walk out in the summertime and visit her and hang out all day. And I'd be walking back at night and it didn't happen every time, but every now and then I just get this feeling when I was walking back, especially on those farm roads, that something was watching And of course, people get that way when they're alone and it's late at night or dark out and you're by yourself. You get a little paranoid, but this was different. While I was walking, I could hear something rustling in the bushes a little bit off the road. And when I say rustling, it was a big noise, but it was probably about 20 feet off the road. But it was going in the same direction as me. When I stopped, it would stop and so on and so forth. And I just, you know, I never got a glimpse of it, never saw anything but i really thought it was probably a sasquatch just from 
you know, I've been in the wilderness and uh, I, I've never had a bear follow me. I've never had a deer follow me like that. And to be honest, what I heard was kind of loud, but deer make a lot of noise when they move through the brush. And this was different. This was almost like it was trying to not make noise, but it sometimes couldn't help it. So that's the other time in Pennsylvania I had what I thought was an encounter. This time I wasn't sure. So we'll flash forward to when I'm about 17 almost. I went on a wilderness survival course thing. And we went to Wyoming and Canada. And we were so deep in Wyoming for three months, we didn't see another human being. We were past Sinks Falls and we climbed up the Grand Tetons and uh, we were pretty deep in there. And one time we were going to be moving camp and they sent one of the counselors and I out ahead to go scout a little bit. And we went, you know, we left in the morning and by evening we were, who knows how far away from the uh, main camp, but we were going to bed down. There was like a little bit of a lake and then there was a ridge line. Like there were some, I want to say caves almost up top and then a ridge line and then the water and it came down. So we were setting up our camp and again, towards dusk, we start hearing like this whooping noise and we're trying to figure out what it is. We were seeing if maybe someone was following us and playing around and we didn't see anything. So we're looking all around, scanning, you know, trying to see what we hear. And then we start hearing rocks being thrown from somewhere and splashing down into the water. So we heard this like five or six times and they were big rocks. I mean, not like boulders, but they weren't pebbles. Some, you know, like the size of a baseball or bigger at least. So we're looking all around. It's getting dark. You know, it's hard to see and uh, we don't see anything. We don't see anything. Then we hear a loud, like a, Again, like a lady screaming almost, like a high-pitched scream uh, mixed with like a animal, so like a howl. It's just so hard to describe, but it sends a chill right down your back. And as soon as I heard it, I knew what it was because I've heard it before. And we're looking, and I look up on the uh, ridge line where the caves are, and there's something up there standing. I mean, big, because it's probably well over 100 feet away maybe closer to 200 feet away but it's big you can see it even in the dark and i you know tapped the uh counselor on his shoulder and i said hey look at this and he looked and he goes is that a bear and i said i don't know what that is which i did know what it was on automatically i knew what it was and we're looking and then before you know it a couple more come out of the cave and a couple more come out. And there are probably like four or five or six of them standing up on this ridge line. And only one of them is very perturbed, pacing back and forth, you know, grunting and huffing and chuffing and throwing rocks. And then we shined a big spotlight flashlight up on them and you got the clear picture right there. And these ones were the different ones. These were brown and they had longer hair. I can't tell you how tall they are. They were so far away, but they were so big. They had to be at least seven foot tall just to see them that clearly. And probably like a linebacker or two stuffed together in width. I mean, they were huge. And, you know, we flashed that big spotlight up there like you use for spotting deer. And that didn't make him very happy. And he started throwing rocks and throwing them harder. And they come further and further. Then he let out a yell, and then he started trucking. He started running down that ridge. It was like a switchback, and he's running back down the ridge, making his way down. I mean, quick, fast, faster than I could have done it, that's for sure. And then he hit the water, the water line, and he jumped in, and he was heading our way, and that was it. We gathered everything up as quick as we could. One of us kept the spotlight on him. Uh, started throwing rocks back, which might have been stupid. The counselor actually had a firearm, and he was ready. You know, he was like, I'm going to shoot this thing if I have to. We gathered everything up as quick as we could. All we had was a lean-to and a couple thermoses and sleeping bags, 
and we took off and we took off the whole ways back to the other camp. We didn't stop all night till we got there. And when we got back, we told everyone we ran into bear that way and we we're going to have to go a different way. We didn't want to say what we saw, but uh, that's exactly what we told them. We ran into bear and we're going to go the other way. So that was in Wyoming. And as I said, they were different. They had longer hair, which I don't know why. I don't know. It gets cold in Wyoming up in the mountains. That could be it. But they had longer hair and they had brown hair. And uh, they weren't very happy. So then we will uh, go back to Pennsylvania in my early 20s. I was down in a place called Mount Pleasant, Pennsylvania. And my brother had a house out there on the outskirts of town. And it was very wooded. There's acres and acres of woods. And he would go... Well, we're, we're part Native American, so we would have sweat lodges and stuff like that on his property. And once in a while, him and I would go deeper into the woods and just camp and just fish on his own property for the weekend. And that's what we were doing at the time. And it's always at dusk. We start hearing upstream, like rocks being thrown and clicking and clacking. And I've never heard the knocking that people always talk about. I've heard thumping, like they're thumping something off the ground, and I've heard rock throwing a definite, but I've never heard that knocking. So we hear the thumping on the ground really heavy, and we hear rocks getting thrown in, into the stream, and we hear rocks being banged off of each other. So, of course, he was armed because we're always armed in the country, and we were sitting there trying to figure out what it was. And we had his schnauzer with us at the time, and she was very on high alert. And by the time it got closer and closer, and you could literally hear the brushes moving and the woods moving, and it would stop maybe 30 feet away, if that, just to where you couldn't see it. And the dog was going crazy and barking, but she didn't go after it, which was she was a schnauzer, but she was brave. She'd go after snapping turtles and everything that were out there. She didn't go after it. She was shaking and barking and flipping out. So, uh, again, being stupid, threw a rock in that direction to see what would happen. And one comes sailing right back, almost hit us, threw another one. And then my brother stood up and yelled, I don't know who's out there or something like that, but I have a gun. Just quit messing around, and then you didn't hear anything. And give it about five minutes or less, you heard something coming up behind us from the other direction. And then you would turn in that direction, and he yelled something, and it would stop, and then you'd hear it coming from the other direction behind you. And this went on for about an hour. They would just, they were circling us, absolutely circling us. And uh, they would get your attention one way, and another one would come closer the other way, get your attention one way, and then the other one would move in. And then towards the end, we just heard that same sound that makes your blood run cold. And we just huffed it out of the woods and headed back home. That was it. And I really think that was the last time I had any type of a uh, run-in with a Sasquatch or a Bigfoot. And the only thing I can tell you on how they look, like I said, the ones that I had first seen when I was young, definitely black, close hair, very gorilla looking, um, as far as I could tell. And except for the gray one that was in the laundry room window, which was really odd. And then the ones I saw in Wyoming, they were absolutely long brown hair. I mean, fairly long. And the ones we heard in Mount Pleasant, we never saw them, didn't want to see them. And honestly, even in Derry, we would go out and everyone's like, did you see footprints? Well, I mean, we saw footprints, but they weren't clearly defined footprints. I've never had the luck of seeing a clearly defined footprint that you could cast or anything. They were just deep in the ground. There were other signs, like I said, though, when we were in Derry, they would pound on the house. The rabbits got mauled. But I've never seen a clearly defined footprint. I can't, I won't sit here and say that I did if I haven't. 
not everything you hear or see in the woods is a Bigfoot. I know what things are in the woods. I know what bears look and sound like. I know what a fox sounds like. Uh, as I stated, I'm kind of Native American. My grandfather taught me at a very early age what these animals sound like. That scream you hear is not a fox. It is not an owl. It is not a bobcat. Whatever it is that you hear, it, it just it just makes your blood run cold. But that's about all I have for what I've seen. I haven't seen anything since now. Like I said, I'm 50 years old, but I haven't been spending any time in the woods and where we used to live is all built up. And to be honest, I don't want to see anything. I don't know where people come off with this. Oh, they're gentle giants. They're so no, but I no. you just get the feeling right away. They're not out to kill you. They're not out to hurt you, but they wouldn't hesitate. And they're very unpredictable. So that's all I have for my story. And that's about it. I shared some of my Bigfoot sightings on episode 55, but I have come back to share more. On August 6th, I went out into the woods in Benzie County to an area that I have been investigating for almost two years at this point. And as soon as I was able to walk about 50 yards in, there is a bush under which I put peanut butter. And as I got within about 30 or 40 feet, I noticed there was a very dark shape in the bush. All of a sudden, the shape moved, and you could tell it was a juvenile Sasquatch. It was dark. You could just make out a little bit of a lighter face, and it ducked inside. I moved to my right to try to get a better view of the juvenile, and as I passed behind the tree, the juvenile moved to the left. So as I moved back to my left, the juvenile moved back into the bush where I couldn't see it. I moved back into the tree to find a better spot and the juvenile pops his face out again. So it was like playing peekaboo with a juvenile Sasquatch for five or so seconds. And then there was a tree knock and the juvenile ran off into the bush. I didn't see him leave, but you could hear him. A week later, on August 13th, I went back to the same area, and in the same bush was the same juvenile, but this time he wasn't as eager to hide. He would move off to what would be his left. I would move behind the tree. You could hear him move. I would move back, and it was literally playing peekaboo again, except this time it goes on for almost five minutes. So to be able to actually play peekaboo and feel like you're having fun with a two-year-old child was absolutely amazing. And after a few minutes, finally another knock and off it ran into the woods. Then in December, I was able to go out one night. It was a snow rain mix. I walked 50 or so yards down from my truck, halfway down a hill. And because it was a snow rain, I didn't want to use my phone with my thermal camera. So I pulled out a small flashlight. And as I'm looking around, I saw two very small yellow eyes very close to the ground. So as I'm watching these eyes, they start pacing, making lines back and forth. But as it's moving back and forth, it's coming closer. And when when it's within about 40 feet, the yellow eyes stop and they're staring at me and they're just a couple inches off the ground. So I finally said to heck with it and pulled out the little thermal for my phone. And when I plugged the thermal in, I was able to see that it was a gigantic raccoon. It was literally as big as my house cat, which is 13 pounds. And he's just sitting there looking at me. I was absolutely terrified it was going to wind up on a YouTube video when you see the raccoons attack people. And that was going to be the end of that. And so I'm kind of chuckling to myself as I'm watching this raccoon. And all of a sudden, on my thermal, you can see a huge arm reach out from behind the tree. It snatches the raccoon, which disappears just like a magician would make a penny disappear. You hear the raccoon screaming what sounds like 
just a woman being murdered, this poor raccoon was screaming for three or four seconds. You hear a loud thud. And then the area goes completely silent. At this point, I'm stunned, still trying to process everything. And just a few seconds later, at the very edge of my flashlight, about seven feet up, you could see two yellow baseball size eyes blink a couple times and disappear. As I start moving my flashlight around, it had gone a little over 40 or 50 yards down to the bottom of the hill, turned, and those two yellow baseball size eyes blinked a couple times and was gone. Never made a sound. I went back the following day to the tree where the raccoon had disappeared. And there were lots of large imprints leading up to the tree and away from the tree. But there was one exceptional footprint that I took a picture of. And you can see it's a 17 inch track and it has five perfect toes in the snow. So it was absolutely a Sasquatch that had snatched the raccoon and made me realize how vulnerable I actually was when I was out in the woods that far from my truck. So it made me realize that there may be some trust being built because he was willing to hunt right in front of me and not even think twice about letting me know he was there. Then last weekend, which would be January 1st, I was out in the woods. And as I'm walking through the woods, fortunately this year we had some rain in Michigan, so the ground was clear. There wasn't very much snow at all. As I'm walking, I can hear footsteps behind me. And I know I'm alone because there was no auto tracks leading up to where I park. It's a seasonal road, so nobody else was down the road, yet I hear footsteps. As I turn to take a picture, there's nothing there. This goes on for several minutes. I would walk, turn around, nothing when I go to take a picture. Even to the point where after about 45 minutes of this, I would even try selfie style. And as soon as I would raise my phone, you could hear something jump behind a tree or lay down on the hill. You heard the noise. And as I kept going, I finally jumped in the air and spun around and was able to see the juvenile Sasquatch, his brown little face, great big eyes, and it was the same juvenile I had played peekaboo with back in August, except he had grown well over a foot by this point. And as soon as he saw me turn around, his eyes got very big and he ducked and laid down on the hill and didn't move after that. So I'm not sure where he went. And all throughout this time, when I go, peanut butter jars that I mentioned on episode 55, I found one Sunday that I had placed in a tree from March 13th. And then by that same tree on January 1st, I find the peanut butter jar with the lid put on and it's slit perfectly clean. I'm not sure what other kind of animal would be able to do that. The tinfoil was peeled off perfectly and found with the jar. So I absolutely believe that this family has decided to stay all winter long in this area. I continue to find 17 inch tracks. I find 23 inch tracks. And during my surgery, I tore my tricep in August, shortly after playing peekaboo. And so I was unable to drive my truck for two months. I would take another small car out there and after two months, I was able to drive the truck. I bring my truck back to where I normally park. I walk down to put peanut butter out and I can hear something moving along my truck. I come back to the top of the hill and down one whole side of my truck from the tail light to the headlight, you can see four fingernails go down the bed of the truck. They're about four inches apart. At the door, they drop down a couple inches. At this point, they're five foot up from the bottom of the truck, from the ground. All four go down the bed of the truck. On the two doors on the passenger side, it dropped to three claw marks. 
And then on the front of the truck, it dropped down to two. And there were 17 inch tracks right up the side of the truck. It covered the whole truck in three steps. That's how many tracks were there. And then two more steps to the wood line. Even to this day, they continue to take the peanut butter. Sometimes they put the lids on, sometimes they don't, but they do lick it clean. I don't think every jar is completely taken by Bigfoot. I even have pictures of a squirrel being a peanut butter thief, eating the end off the jar of peanut butter I had stuffed in the tree. So I do know other animals take them, but the other, I don't know any other animal that will take it from a fence post, lick it clean, put the lid on, and then stick it back in the fence post like happens several weeks ago. My Bigfoot sighting involved what I believe to be an Albot witch. My name is Nate Marks. I'm from Pennsylvania, northeastern Pennsylvania, and I was from a town called Albertus. It's a small town about 20 miles east of Allentown, a pretty big city. And in the town of Albertus, there was a park. There still is a park called Lockridge Furnace, and a lot of the area around it was at one time a whole bunch of fields. And now it's all developed. It's all a little suburbia spread out there. But in the fields, there was a whole lot of woods, fields, and it was at the base of a lot of mountains. I've been to that park thousands of times as a young kid. And of one of these thousands of times, I saw something that I had repressed in memory. And then it was later brought up to me by somebody else. And it made this memory come alive again and i realized that what i'd seen uh deserves to be thought about and reevaluated and talked about and this is exactly what it was that i saw myself and a friend josh pearson we were 13 and we were walking around in lockridge park through a field and on the outskirts of a field there was a bunch of hedges and and bushes and foliage and we noticed some sort of long, lanky, long-armed, dark creature crawling on its hands and knees or crawling on its belly. And it was just such an uneasy, awkward movement. The way it would use its long arms, pull itself, slide up, and then lay flat. We're walking in the field and we notice some movement in the bushes and we look over. And it's about 8 in the morning. and I remember thinking to my friend or saying out loud, is that a guy in a suit? What is that? Is that a dog? Is that a bear? And as we walked, this thing looked curious. If it was just a wild animal, I don't think it would be trying to be sneaky and crawl along the hedges parallel to us as it did. As we're walking, this thing continued to crawl and looking over, I couldn't really make out a face, but I could see that it's covered in hair. It's very slender, and it's long. And every time we would stop, it would stop, and it was probably about 50 feet away, and it would just lay back down on the ground. And um, we probably walked for about a couple minutes noticing this thing, and both me and my friend were very freaked out. And uh, we tried not to make ourselves look vulnerable, so we didn't run, but we hastily walked away from that area. And that was... A hominoid, hairy, long creature, not indigenous to Pennsylvania that I could think of, nothing like it. And we walked out of the woods, and that is the beginning chapter of what I had almost completely forgot about. I had never seen anything like it. I never talked about it just between me and Josh when we were 13. And that was one day in Lockridge Park in Pennsylvania. Now, about three years later, I'm very fortunate also, I want to interject, I'm very fortunate that every time I had seen a paranormal occurrence uh, or an unexplainable phenomenon, I'm very fortunate that I shared it with somebody else. So I was not just my word against anyone else where I could, you know, I didn't have to pinch myself and figure out if it was a dream or not. I was with somebody else that could verify that we were seeing something that was unusual. So about three years later, I'm 16. I'm in the same park, Lockridge Park in Albertus, Pennsylvania, and I'm with a friend, Tom, and there in the springtime or summertime, you have fireflies or lightning bugs, depends what you call them, 
and there was a lightning bug that came out of the ground or it seemed to come out of the ground, but it was a, a red lightning bug. I remember saying to my friend, Hey, that's a red lightning bug. I never seen one of those. And we're looking at this flickering red light. And as it approached us, it got bigger and the ball of light expanded and contracted. And then the light was like a light I've never seen. It was, uh, it was very bright and iridescent had swirling colors inside it but it was a contained glow it didn't illuminate anything the glow was inside this ball and as it approached us i held on to my friend tom and he held on to me and it was just basically kind of like a game of chicken like i don't want him to run but if he took off running i was going to take off running this ball of light approached us and as it approached us it began to expand and contract and when it got to about 10 feet ahead of us it was conscientious of us and curious of us and approached us a beam of light shot out from underneath this ball of light and i believe it became the silhouette of what was looking like feet or was trying to form the silhouette of another of a more complete structure made of light and tom took off running and i followed him and i ran out of the park took off running and i was kind of raised religious growing up and my first thought was, and I, and I wasn't very much a fan of church, but when I was running away, I was my first thing was yell, thank you, God, thank you, thank you, God, because I feel like I was blessed with the, some sort of uh, really rare exclusive glimpse into a higher power. Most people can just go by faith, but I felt like, wow, I saw proof of like a higher power or conscientious being that's interactive with us from another world or an interdimensional world. And I took off running. And this is how it relates to what I saw, I believe, was an Albot witch. And I took off running. I ran into my home and my mom and dad, they were sitting there watching TV. And me and Tom ran into the living room and we're both, our, our eyes are bugged out of our heads and we're panting. And she's like, looks like you saw a ghost. I said, I think I did see a ghost. And uh, we went back, we looked around. We didn't see any ball of light, any orbs, anything creepy or freaky. And so I'm telling everybody in Alberta, I'm 16, that I saw this unusual ball of light that approached us and seemed to chase us and it turned into some sort of silhouette and we took off running. Now, I'm telling all my friends this stuff in Alberta. So all the kids in Alberta, they're relaying what they had seen in Lockridge. Lockridge is a hangout place, especially if you're a teenager. You can go there and walk around. It's a beautiful park. And I have a friend, Mike. And Mike, I'm going to do a Mike. Impression. He has a very distinct kind of like monotone voice. He said, um, well, that, that's where I saw the ground sloth. I said, well, what's a ground sloth? He says, well, one time I was in the park at night and it was like a full moon and Damien and I were standing out in the grass and underneath this giant pine tree, I saw a ground sloth crawl out into the shadows and slide across the grass and go up another tree. And he got down on his hands and feet and belly and mimicked this belly type slide across the ground and he's describing this at 16 and when he got on the ground and did this my heart sank into my belly and i realized that i had a repressed memory of seeing some sort of what i thought was a guy in a bear suit or an, uh, an unidentifiable type hominoid whatever it was i saw i didn't think to dare talk about it didn't think to think about it when i saw mike do an impression of his ground sloth belly crawl I was so stunned that this memory came back that I realized I had seen the same thing when I was about 13 with Josh in the same park. And I had then coined this term sloth, Pennsylvania sloth, Pennsylvania ground sloth. And I talked about it. I made a, I'm a musician and I've been always fascinated by paranormal phenomenon and reading up on it. But more importantly, I really like hearing people's stories, but I find this kind of like a sensational commercialism attached to people wanting to get attention. I don't watch the Discovery Channel. I watch History Channel. So when I want to talk about it, I want people to say, oh, yeah, I saw that on TV or something like, you know, I, I want to talk to people that actually don't watch TV and <laughs> go out in the woods and see unusual things for themselves. But uh, when Mike described what he had seen, I realized that I'd seen the same thing. So I took Mike's term, the ground sloth, and adopted that. And I had made a, an album called Hex and Dance. And that was the cover of my first album, which is a ground sloth coming out of an orb. 
and it was dedicated to Lockridge Park. And a couple of the songs mentioned Sloth and Orb of Lockridge Park. So I had then, let's see, I made that album when I was about 20. I'm 40 now, so about 2003, 2004, I start singing about Sloth and Orb. I talk about it. Anybody who wants to hear about the Orb or the Ground Sloth, I love talking about it. My brother thinks I'm nuts. My parents, they don't want to hear about it. But they could see the genuine, sincere expression of like tear and awe when I came home from the orb sighting. They definitely know that I was not a hoax. And I'm not making that up. I'm not that clever an actor to put them on like that. So that begat a lifelong, curious dedication to finding out about cryptids and things I don't understand. And when you go and do your own research, you find out that Every state has a cryptid or some sort of lore, or if you don't want to get into uh, the folklore of it, there's just unusual sightings from old newspapers. People can't explain what they saw, whether it's a UFO, a Bigfoot, a wild man, a reptile creature, a giant bird, some sort of sea serpent or a lake serpent. People have seen all kinds of things that science can't explain. No zoologist can put a name on it. And as part of my fascination i wanted to relate to other people that have seen this kind of thing and sift through all the sensational attention hunger and talk to people that don't just want to talk about bigfoot they want to share their experiences with what they had seen or claimed to have seen as a bigfoot so i joined a couple bigfoot facebook groups i've been on facebook a couple years and i've been in this bigfoot facebook group for a couple years and i had made a, I would say it's about like a one page, seven paragraph account of the Albat Witch. And I don't even think I brought up the orb, but I mentioned this hominoid lanky creature that I had seen in Lockridge Park. And then in the feed or the responses, somebody said, I think you saw an Albat Witch. Reading that word for the first time, I didn't know what an Albat Witch was. We're in a digital era, so I can type in Albat Witch and see what happens. And lo and behold, Google reveals that Pennsylvania has had enough of these sightings to have given it a name. Now, I don't know if it's from the Pennsylvania Dutch, Pennsylvania Germans that have odd names for a lot of things, or if it was a play on a Lenape word, the Lenape Indians that were here, a play on that word. But apparently this Albot Witch term has existed for a couple hundred years. The PA Germans came in the 1600s, but (laughs) the... uh, etymology of albot which means apple thief or an apple elf like it would steal apples so i thought that was kind of funny there was no apples around i didn't get time to ask this thing how it stands on apple pilfering but it was interesting to know that this term had existed and to have uh, been lucky enough to have seen it and then have a shared platform where i could talk to people and then become better enlightened on a pre-existing term already describing what I had seen. And Pennsylvania is a big state. I'm on the northeast side of it. And more in central Pennsylvania, there are Albot Witch festivals near Lancaster. It's funny out there. It's mostly flat. So it's all farmland. Bigfoots are mostly known to be mountain dwelling. So the Albot Witch, just to clarify for people that don't know what an Albot Witch is, I'll do that for you if you don't feel like Googling it. Whereas Bigfoots are known to be probably seven to nine feet tall and large. An Albot Witch is known to be small and slender and have traditionally long arms and long legs. And it likes to hang out in trees. Now, according to the Google, the PA Dutch thinks it likes to steal apples as well. I don't know anything about that. But I guess if you were an apple farmer and something's picking your apples... Somebody had seen it and gave it a name. So that is where the apple picking legend is born. So here I am talking about an Albot witch, or what I believe to have been an Albot witch. And I remember talking to some friends, and I live about an hour south of the Poconos, and the Poconos are a gorgeous, huge, mountainous area of Pennsylvania. And somebody said, Oh, well, there's Pocono tree apes. What's a tree ape? Anybody that knows. North America knows there's no indigenous apes or monkeys or orangutans or chimps in the United States. So this guy says, I've seen a tree ape leap from one tree to another. And it it sounds like what you saw. It's like a a small hairy man with long arms swinging from a tree. And he had seen it. And uh, I only know one person that had that term. And I've asked other people from the Poconos. I mean, you can be out in the Poconos and be 
20 miles away from a, a road or a gas station. So it's very rural out there. I can't say the same about the Lehigh Valley where I live now, but it's very rural. So it's, if something were to be successfully hiding for hundreds of years, you could probably do a little bit easier in the Poconos, even though there's lots of hunters and hikers. There has been someone named Dan, I don't know his last name, but he had mentioned something about a Pocono tree ape. And so that further confirms that I am not alone, other than other people talking about Albot witches, that there is some sort of slender, hairy creature in Pennsylvania that has a preference for trees and hanging out in trees or foliage. And what I saw slithered on the ground, I did not see it go down or go up a tree. It just crawled parallel on its belly, spying, if you will, on me and Josh walking around Lockridge Park when I was about 13. And uh, that is my Albert Witch story. So I'm going to digress here. I don't know how interesting this is, but I once was walking around at a flea market and I saw a guy with a shirt, a t-shirt that said Pennsylvania Bigfoot Society. And I was blown away that such a shirt existed or such a society existed. And I never really talked about Bigfoot or Albot Witch. I didn't know what the Albot Witch was at this time. So I went up to this gentleman and I said, hey, I really like your shirt. Where'd you get it? Is that for real? And he says, oh, it was a gift. But yes, the Bigfoot Society is real. And it's kind of more based in western Pennsylvania, out towards Pittsburgh in the central PA with the Allegheny Mountains and such. It's huge and very underpopulated. It's almost as it was hundreds of thousands of years ago. The mountains are untapped. You can go off forever. And there's, I've looked up this map of what Bigfoot sightings are. There's lots of Bigfoot sightings or reports, mostly in central PA because northeastern PA is densely populated. There's strip malls and highways everywhere you go. And this guy was wearing a Pennsylvania Bigfoot t-shirt. And I went up to him and I said, do you believe in Bigfoot? He says, yeah, I do, but not under the traditional ways that most people think of them. What I think they are, they're holograms, or basically it's a disguise. The Bigfoot, as we know it, is some sort of disguise that creatures from other astral realms use to camouflage themselves to gather information. They're interdimensional, holographic, and that is how you never find a carcass or a skeleton of Bigfoots. You could find all kinds of sightings, but people generally don't see Bigfoot youth, for instance. You never see a litter of Bigfoots or a small Bigfoot. If anybody's ever seen one, it's a full-length Bigfoot, and it's probably traveling alone. Now, I know there's old reports and old from Alexander the Great and uh, the, in the biblical days of documenting giants and Nephilim, which are very much real and did exist. People don't talk about Bigfoots in plural or Bigfoots as youth. So this guy put this idea in my head that Bigfoots are not maybe creatures as we know in the mammal family, that they might be interdimensional or holographic, and they come here to gather information for whatever purpose, for wherever they go. And he referenced a incident. He says, whenever you hear about Bigfoot sightings, there's usually a correlation with UFO sightings. And you know, this is a kind of, you can lose some people because it sounds a bit radical or extreme. But he mentioned uh, what I looked up later flatwoods west virginia in the 1950s 1952 flatwoods west virginia there was multiple reports of ufo sightings or some giant fireball whatever it's an unidentified flying object but there was multiple sightings of a giant fireball type structure going all over the outer space out in west virginia sky in the same week, there was multiple sightings of a 10-foot-tall giant creature. The people described its eyes and its oddball claw-like hands. It's not described as anybody that's ever seen a Bigfoot, but it was a giant, and it was unidentifiable, and there's so many people saw it, and they made mainstream news. In fact, it was considered, this is 1952, uh, it was considered like one of the top 10 articles of the year. Journalists loved it. People wrote books about it. People went back there and did studies of it, but... I'm only referencing this because the guy in the Pennsylvania Bigfoot shirt enlightened me as to what the Flatwoods monster was, and that would maybe support his theory that Bigfoots, as we know them, might be camouflaged tourists or dispatched surveyors that are just sent here 
to gather what information, I don't know, and for what purpose, I don't know. But they may not be, Bigfoots might not live in caves, they might not sleep in trees, they might be from another dimension, to be quite frank. They might be from another dimension. Well, that's it for tonight's show. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let us know. Thanks for listening. Have a great night. Seen a bunch of run-down new horse towns Where the church is the backbone, loves in the bow And the five-string melodies grooving With the farmland rows where the roots run deep Beyond the noise of the busy streets Where the songs of the south are soothing When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music yeah.